Today is Saturday, February 19th. The world is watching Russia and Ukraine closely. Even though Russia denies it's planning an assault on Ukraine, American and NATO officials say Russia's invasion plan is already in motion. So how did we get here? What is Russia likely planning? And who will get involved and get hurt if this invasion actually happens? Today, we're discussing the threat of war with author and scholar Nina Jankowicz. She's an internationally recognized expert on disinformation and its impact on democracies. Nina previously served as an advisor to the Ukrainian Foreign Ministry and has shared her expertise with Congress and the European Parliament. Here's our conversation that we hope will help you better understand the current conflict and what to expect next. Welcome, welcome to the Newsworthy Special Edition Saturday, when we sit down with a different expert or celebrity every Saturday to talk about something in the news. Don't forget to tune in every Monday through Friday for our regular episodes, where we provide all the day's news in 10 minutes. I'm Erica Mandy. It's now time for today's Special Edition Saturday. Nina, thank you for coming on the Newsworthy. Thanks for having me, Erica. So let's start by talking big picture. I know it can be complicated, but can you at least try to briefly summarize for our listeners the relationship between Russia and Ukraine and how their history led to this point? Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union, voted to become independent in 1991. As a result of that vote for independence, was left with a large nuclear arsenal and in 1994 gave up that arsenal for the guarantee of its own sovereignty. And this was an agreement called the Budapest Memorandum signed by the U.S., the U.K., and very notably Russia. Since 2014, Russia has been in violation of that agreement. It unilaterally annexed the Crimean Peninsula of Ukraine, held a sham election there, and has been supporting separatist forces in the east of the country, what's called the Donbass region, since 2014, in a conflict that has killed 14,000 people. And all of this is because Ukraine wants to be on a Euro-Atlantic path. It wants to integrate with EU uh, and NATO. And I just saw today um, there is new opinion polling that says over 60% of Ukrainians are in favor of membership with both of those organizations. And that was really what the Euromaidan revolution, which your listeners might remember from 2014, was about. People really wanting to be able to choose their own political affiliations, to have a European country, to you know really orient themselves toward democracy. And Russia didn't like this because when Ukraine is anti-democratic, when Ukraine is corrupt, then Ukraine can be pushed around. And let's be clear, why does Russia feel so strongly that it does not want Ukraine to ever join NATO? Putin himself said that the fall of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe in history. Um, He's very nostalgic for the Soviet Union. And so when we look at gradual NATO and EU expansion, he sees these Western organizations creeping closer and closer to his border. And in fact, Russian propaganda and Putin himself talk about NATO encirclement of Russia. Now, let's be clear, Russia's borders are quite huge, and NATO currently only touches 6% of them. Even if Ukraine were to be admitted, Russia would still have plenty of its border that, you know, wasn't touching a NATO state. And I think it's more about hegemony in a former sphere of influence that Russia wants. Russia wants control over Ukraine's gas, Ukraine's farming industry, uh, and Ukraine's political affiliations and, and to be able to milk Ukraine for all it's worth. If Ukraine is democratic, Ukraine can't be controlled. And that's problematic for Russia. And despite the majority of Ukrainians wanting to be part of NATO, NATO is not so sure about that. Why? NATO has a pretty stringent list of criteria that member states or potential member states need to meet. They need to really reform their military, their economy, their democratic systems. NATO is a community of democracies. And Ukraine has a long way to go with all three of those categories. But also, there's a frozen conflict in Ukraine. Even without this current flare-up that we're talking about, there has been a, a war in Ukraine going on for eight years, just as there has been in the Republic of Georgia or in Moldova. Russia knows this, right? And so that's why it keeps these conflicts you know, somewhat active, so that NATO and the EU won't admit these conflicts countries while those conflicts are going on. So since Ukraine is not a member of NATO, there are differing opinions about how much NATO should be involved in this current tense situation. What are the arguments for and against NATO involvement right now? 
I actually think there's a little bit of a misconception that, you know, NATO would come to Ukraine's aid or be defending Ukraine against Russia. That's really not on the table from NATO. It's not on the table from any NATO member states. What we're seeing actually is just individual expressions of support from NATO members. So countries like the US, the UK, the Baltic states, Poland have offered Ukraine weaponry to protect itself and protect its borders. But nobody's considering sending troops. NATO is not considering sending troops. What NATO has done is increased force readiness in NATO countries so that if Russia did invade Ukraine and the conflict spilled over to Poland, let's say, which touches Ukraine's borders or to Hungary or Romania, then NATO forces would be ready. That's all that anybody is considering. No one wants to send NATO forces to war over a conflict in in Ukraine. It's more about a defensive posture that if this conflict, again, were to spill over into NATO territory, that NATO would be ready. And that's what the alliance is supposed to do. U.S. intelligence officials have warned that Russia could stage a false flag operation, or in other words, kind of fake an attack on them to create a reason to invade Ukraine. So what might Russia do? And why do you think America shared that potential publicly? Yeah, this is really interesting and something that's new for the United States and its allies, trying to achieve deterrence through declassification. A false flag operation could take many different forms. And Russia has actually done this before in Ukraine. They've hired actors to say that, you know, certain atrocities had been committed and and this stuff airs on Russian propaganda networks in Russia to give the pretext for more military action. What the U.S. government said might happen this time is the faking of some sort of atrocity in the Donbass region, including the use of of dead bodies from a morgue, uh, showing these dead bodies, showing more and and using this false operation as a pretext for war. We also heard this week from Secretary of State Antony Blinken at the UN that potential false flag chemical weapon attacks could occur or potential shelling operations, shelling targets that are held by the Russian separatists in Ukraine in order to make it look like Ukraine is involved in some sort of attack. And finally, we've seen President Putin and many Russian officials talking about a quote unquote genocide happening in eastern Ukraine. Now, there's no evidence for such a genocide. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which has many members, including the United States and Russia, has access to the separatist regions and has seen no evidence of a genocide. But Putin is is putting this out, including to a report that's been filed at the United Nations in order, again, to create this pretext for defense of Russian speakers and individuals in the Donbass of Ukraine. Russia has used disinformation, not only by creating these physical scenes, but just in the online world to create a narrative. I know you wrote the book about how Russia uses disinformation as a weapon. So what are some of the narratives you've seen playing out in the current conflict? That Ukraine is full of neo-Nazis and is a fascist country, allegedly. Now, just like any country, there are some far right elements in Ukraine, but they don't hold political power. They didn't get any seats in parliament in the election. We can dispense with that one. The second narrative is that NATO has somehow reneged on an agreement with Russia and that this expansion of NATO or potential expansion that might happen many years in the future is encircling Russia. And this is aggressive behavior and Russia needs to respond to it. And then the final and and third narrative that I've really been seeing a lot of folks on the fringes of the American political spectrum talking about is this idea that the energy and military lobbies in the United States are pushing for war in Ukraine so that they can make money. Perhaps there are some people out there who, who are warmongers who want war, but every action that I have seen coming from the U.S. diplomatic corps, coming from the Biden administration, coming from its allies, has been fervent and tireless diplomacy in order to avoid war, to ensure that Ukrainians can live in peace and vote for the direction they want their government to take without this bloody conflict. Coming up, is there still a chance to talk it out instead of invade? Our guest expert shares her predictions, including whether she thinks Russia's leader has been bluffing. Plus, how an attack on Ukraine could impact Europe and the United States as well. But first, let's take a quick break to thank our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by Masterworks. It's a new year, which means it's time for new ideas. And turns out that women may be better investors than men. That's right. According to research, women investors outperform their male counterparts. So what gives some women investors an edge? They're more likely to be risk conscious with their investments, according to this research. 
and one asset that can help diversify your portfolio and is not so correlated to traditional stocks and bonds is blue chip contemporary art. And typically, it's only the bajillionaires like Beyonce and Bezos who can afford a chic Picasso for their walls. But Masterworks is changing all of that. Masterworks is the startup giving everyday investors a piece of the art pie, or palette to be metaphorical. They've made blue chip art investable, so you can own a fraction of a multi-million dollar piece of art. That way, anyone can add paintings by artists like Monet, Basquiat, and Banksy to their portfolio without paying millions. And you can join them by going to masterworks.art slash newsworthy. Again, that's masterworks.art slash newsworthy. See important disclosures at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. This episode is also brought to you by Stitch Fix. Want to refresh your wardrobe with seasonal pieces that actually feel like you? That's where Stitch Fix comes in. All you do to get started is take a style quiz so Stitch Fix can learn your preferences, like your favorite colors to wear, your preferred fits and price ranges. From there, Stitch Fix gets to work. Either a stylist will send you five pieces chosen just for you, then you can try them on, keep what you like, and return the rest. It's easy, and I find it really fun to see what comes in each fix. Or allow Stitch Fix to build an online store customized to your preferences. I appreciate that Stitch Fix Freestyle allows me to shop one piece at a time when that's all I'm looking for. It's the easy way to get items that are just right for you from brands you know and trust without that endless browsing. I also really like how it visually shows me what else works well with that sweater or those particular jeans, for example. So get started today by filling out your free style quiz at stitchfix.com slash newsworthy and take advantage of free shipping and free returns. That's stitchfix.com slash newsworthy to try Stitch Fix. stitchfix.com slash newsworthy. Okay, now back to my conversation with Nina Jankowicz. When we're dealing with Russia, how realistic is it that talks and negotiations will work this time? I have not been particularly optimistic about the idea of diplomacy with regard to Russia for the past several months. Um, In late 2021, we saw this list of demands come out from the Russian foreign ministry stating, okay, you're not going to allow NATO expansion to come to Ukraine. You're going to pull back your equipment, et cetera, et cetera. These weren't realistic demands. If Russia was concerned about collective security, there are plenty of things that the United States has worked on with Russia with regard to collective security before, including nuclear nonproliferation, including counterterrorism measures. Ukraine just doesn't pose a threat to Russia. Russia has always been the instigator of conflict with Ukraine. And this is more about achieving hegemony in this former sphere of influence, pushing out Western interests and, and using Ukraine to ulterior motives for, uh, for the Russian regime, whether that's corruption or for economic purposes. I think the idea here with diplomacy was, was to make sure that they had checked all the boxes and said, well, we tried. We tried to negotiate with you and you couldn't meet our demands. You were never serious about these negotiations. So we're left with no choice but to go to war now. And I think we all need to recognize this bluff here. In the current conflict, what is Russia hoping to gain if they invade? What outcome do they want? Russia wants the West, and in particular, the United States, completely out of its sphere of influence. It doesn't want anything American democratic to be in countries of the former Soviet space or the former communist space. Uh, And through that, Russia can achieve greater dominance than it has before. As I said, Putin's greatest geopolitical tragedy is the fall of the Soviet Union. He's always working to increase Russia's status. And that's why the disinformation is so ingenious in a way, because through a very inexpensive, fairly easy campaign, Russia can bring to the table some of the leaders of the world who want to talk about, you know, stop interfering in our elections, leave Ukraine alone. How many summits have we had since 2016 between the Russian president and U.S. leaders? And that's exactly what Putin wants. So I think that's really what he's after through the disinformation campaigns, through the Ukraine invasion. It elevates his status. It gives him more control over the countries around him and the countries that he's dealing with on the global stage and cements that seat at the negotiating table for him. And what are the potential consequences if this invasion happens for everyone else? 
I think that's a really important question, Erica, that we tend to lose sight of here in the West because we think of Ukraine as someplace that's far away. You know, it's all gunmetal gray, post-Soviet. Nobody thinks about it. But Ukraine is this dynamic, vibrant place that really deserves to chart its own path, number one. So please, everybody remember that ultimately the first victims of this conflict have been and will be Ukrainians. There's a potential for a really bloody conflict if this goes through. And that's going to be on the doorstep of Europe. It is going to change the security fabric of Europe, the economic fabric, not only of Europe, but the United States. We just heard President Biden this week talking about how gas prices very well might go up when the United States introduces sanctions on Russia, because we do get quite a large amount of gas and and oil that comes through Russian pipelines. So that's going to have an effect. And it's going to have an effect on the world economy more broadly, because Russia is is a player in the world economy. If the conflict grows past Ukraine, things could be really dire, something that we've not seen in generations um, to the effect of World War II. I mean, Timothy Snyder's book, Bloodlands, is a great one for anyone who's looking for the history of, of that particular part of Europe, Ukraine and Poland and Belarus. That's where the world's conflicts over the past you know, 100 years or so have, have all been fought. The security situation is really precarious. We should not accept 150,000 troops on the border of a sovereign nation as the status quo at all in 2022. And this, according to Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO general secretary, that might be the case now, unless we can avoid this. So it might seem far away, but we wouldn't want any of our loved ones to be in such a conflict. And it's going to have effects here, uh, no matter how far away Ukraine seems to all of us right now. Do you have a prediction of how this is going to play out? I try not to generally look into my crystal ball about anything concerning Putin, because he's fairly unpredictable. But... At this point, having seen the open source intelligence coming from people on the ground in in Russia and Belarus who are seeing convoys of tanks and artillery and things like that go by, I don't think this is a bluff. If it's a bluff, it's a very expensive and confusing bluff, one that I think would damage Putin a lot and his credibility a lot, even more than it's already been damaged. At this point, I, I have a hard time seeing how something doesn't happen. Now, this might just be Russia attempting to solidify its control over these separatist territories and the Donbass. But it could be more than that if Russia is emboldened as well. I worry as I engage on platforms like TikTok, especially that the disinformation about Ukraine and conspiracy theories, straight up just nonsense that people are really bought into, it's going to be really hard to push back on. And it makes me sad because that's just not that's not the reality on the ground in Ukraine. This is a 45 million people who have very, very um, familiar values to American citizens. I just hope that this is able to be averted, that there is not much loss of life, if any at all, and, and that one day Ukraine can live without the threat of its looming you know, big brother in Russia trying to destabilize it all the time. The Ukrainians deserve that. Well, thank you to Nina Jankowitz for sharing her insights with us. For more, check out her book, How to Lose the Information War, Russia, Fake News, and the Future of Conflict. We have a link in our episode notes. We'll, of course, continue to bring you the latest updates on the situation in Ukraine in our regular weekday episodes. You can tune in every Monday through Friday for our 10-minute news roundups. We'll be back on Monday. Until then, have a great weekend.